sir. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Honorable Presidents of Chambers, dear participant, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum. I am very pleased to join you in the concluding session of this important conference, which has brought together all the leaders of the business community from Pakistan. Your presence testifies the significance of the occasion and background in which it is being held. As you are aware of our economy stands on a crossroad, where the choices and decisions we make today would have long-term implications. But these decisions are as imperative and we cannot shift this responsibility. I am particularly pleased to note that the theme of the conference in reforming Pakistan's economy for inclusive growth, which is so apt for the cohesion, these two ingredients, sustainability and inclusiveness, are the core durable economic progress. Before I outline my recommendations for economic progress uh, and make it sustainable and inclusive growth strategy, it would be useful to briefly list the key challenges our economy is facing. These are described below. One, even though of late inflation has come down, it has remained historically very high. Clearly, this has adversely affected the welfare of low-income groups, especially these earning wages of salaries whose incomes could not be adjusted as fast as the prices are rising. Number two, what is more disconcerting is the fact that during nearly a decade, the economic growth GDP has either been anemic or stagnant. Taken together, these two features pose existential threats to our economy. Number three, yet another consequence of this is the unprecedented level of interest rates prevailing the financial sector. Despite recent decline in inflation, interest rates have not come down, which is still as high as 20.5%. The business leader can well appreciate that such rates survival existing industries is at stake. What to talk about new investments? This would further retard growth as investments would not be forthcoming. Fourth, the ferocious government demands for borrowing is unaffected by rising interest rates and therefore the commercial banks are left with little room to give credit to the private sector. Number five, for more than five years, fiscal deficit is in the range of 70, seven to eight percent, which is again unprecedented and not sustainable. More resources consumed in the government sector and dare too far consumption purposes the longer it would take to rehabilitate and revive the economy. Six, for the last two years, the external sector is nearly marginalized by massive restrictions on imports to conserve the precarious level of foreign reserves. The exchange, number seven, the exchange rate suffered massive devaluation in early 2022-23, but lately the during this calendar government has succeeded in bringing it to a stable level. Eight, during the calendar year, the stock market has shown great deal of promise, building the hope of political stability and IMF program, program after the installation of new elected government. But as business leaders are aware, stock market's performance 
is not a test of strength of an economy. At best, it reflects a positive sentiment that needs to be further nurtured and strengthened. Nine, we are also facing energy crisis. As prices of power and gas are increasing at a fast pace, and one doesn't expect this situation to be corrected in the immediate future. 10. In the wake of such developments, there are limited investments following per capita income, rising unemployment, and worsening poverty. 11. Finally, note that while a multitude and adverse external factors have contributed significantly to such, a, such poor outcomes our own. 12. Policy failure, political instability, and declining standards of governance are no less responsible. I would like to just mention some other problems which have bearing on economy and should be attended in a comprehensive policy framework. These include rising political divisions, law and order challenges, environmental degradation, inadequate coverage and outreach social welfare, programs for the poor, and alarming rise in population. Given the above precarious and untenable picture of the economy and surrounding challenges in other connected areas, we have to make a radical break from the policies of the recent past. What has not worked in the past will not work in the future also. So we have to think out of the box and find new ideas and summon all resources, men and material, to begin a journey which would be slow, but it would be destined to succeed. Let me outline the broad contours of strategy which would promote sustainable and inclusive growth. Sustainable growth. One, for any nation, sustainable growth requires independence primarily on nation's own strengths, men, materials, savings, and natural resources. This is essentially a road to building self-resilient, self-reliant economy. In particular, the nation must avoid dependence on borrowing and foreign aid. For the last 75 years, our growth was consistently based on external help and its volatility reflected changing moods and priorities of loan-giving nations and agencies. Now we say reached, now we have reached a point where not only the foreign support has become limited and costly, but if we continue to follow this path, we run the risk of compromising the national sovereignty. Two, the recent economic survey has estimated that our investment to GDP ratio has fallen to 13%, which is the lowest in five decades. Such a pathetic rate is woefully insufficient to meet the growing population alone to promote meaningful prosperity of all our people. But we should shun any suggestion to increase investments but relentless borrowing as in the past. We must limit investments to our domestic resources, savings, barring foreign support for specific physical projects with well-established social and financial returns. Four, another benchmark we must adhere to is to limit our imports to our exports, earning, and remittances from overseas Pakistanis. This would almost eliminate the balance of payments deficit, which is perennial malice that frequently forces us to seek assistance from IMF and other lending agencies. Five, the primary source of Pakistan is its people who are inherently smart and dexterous, but we have remained shy of investing in them. The more we invest in them, the larger would be social and financial returns for the country, especially because of untold opportunities of growth in the IT 
and telecommunication sectors. Six, finally, it must be recognized that it is not the job of the government to do business. By definition, business belongs to private sector. The government is a huge burden on the economy through unending demand of borrowing, which distorts the financial banking sector as it raises interest rates and denies credit to business and industry. Government's job is only one, and that is to be an umpire, a regulator, enforce laws, ensure that there are no manipulation in independent working of the markets. Inclusive growth. Number seven, for too long we have told our people that once growth takes place, it will trickle down to the low income groups. This thinking has to be abundant. Rather, we must ensure that all stakeholders should benefit from the growth from the very start. In fact, this would mean that all segments will get adequate space to contribute to growth. Eight, to achieve inclusive growth, we have to enable small and medium scale industry, cottage industry, women participation, all professional occupations, including entrepreneurship or youth are differently able citizens and members of minorities. As I said earlier, we have a large pool of human resources that only need skills and training to become productive members of the society. This is the role of the government, which it must undertake diligently and spiritedly. This then is the broad outline of the strategy and reforms agenda that would enable sustainable and inclusive growth. I once again thank you, Mr. President, for affording me this wonderful opportunity to share my views on this important theme of the conference, Pakistan Zindabad.